So we have arrived at the quarter way mark and what I think I will do is categorize and archive Psalm 1 to Psalm 30 as volume 1 and volume 2 will be Psalm 31 and beyond by the grace of God it has taken 12 months to record 30 Psalms 52 weeks and as of last week we have recorded 32 hours 34 minutes and 54 seconds and by the grace of God we will continue to push on I have no idea how long it will take to do volume 2 but by the grace of God we've been able to cover a lot of ground during very difficult and uh, uncertain times dear father we pray for your grace and mercy this morning please fill us with thy spirit please uh, settle our minds our hearts our spirits please rejuvenate us uh, recharge our batteries allow us to go again for another 12 months the last 12 months have been incredibly difficult for all of us for different reasons but by the grace of god we were able to finish the first 30 psalms and we will begin the 31st psalm and uh, who knows where we will be this time next year we thank you for our salvation all of our past present and future sins are washed away in the blood of the lamb but of course we have to confess our sins each and every day to stay in fellowship with thee Please be with us this morning and uh, throughout the rest of this coming week and uh, what's left of this month as we continue to live through very difficult and very dark times. And we pray for the blood of Christ to wash away all of our sins, to be filled with the Spirit of God so we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray for your grace now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Psalm 31. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. It goes back to in God we trust, but make it more personal, in God I trust. Going back to John chapter 3, unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. There's no point saying, what about this person, or what about that person, how about you? It goes back to that scripture in 1 Peter, how Christ, being the just, died for the unjust. Of course, he is just, we are the unjust. Until you see yourself as being unjust, you won't appreciate what the just has done for you. In thee, O Lord, it's personal. Do I put my trust, not our trust, like the children of Israel, or our trust as a so-called church of Christ, the body of Christ, which of course we are, but in the sense of, do I put my trust in a personal sense, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust, let me never be ashamed, deliver me in thy righteousness. Keep your hand there, and go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1. I sat down yesterday morning. I wanted to finish the book of Daniel, which I was able to do. Did it in two mornings. I went to uh, 1 Timothy. Then I went to 2 Timothy. Then I went to uh, Titus. Got a great blessing. And I found some great verses to speak about this morning. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1. Look at verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Why is that, Paul? For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So it's who you know, not what you know. Uh, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Going back to verses uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, the just shall live by faith, we walk by faith, not by sight. For I know whom I have believed, past tense, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day, that the judgment seat of Christ. Go back to Psalm 31. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness, imputation, Going back to Isaiah 64, 6, how all of our righteousnesses is as filthy rags. I want to discuss that more this morning. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never, never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. And one more time, Second Peter, uh, Second Peter 1, 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed under him against that day. Paul knew where he was going upon death. So would King David. Go back to Psalm 31. This time look at verse 2. Bow down thine ear to me. 
deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock, for an house of defence to save me. In Luke chapter 9, the Lord Jesus Christ says to his apostles and vicariously those that were standing around, let these words sink down into your ears. He's making the point that what he's saying needs to be taken very seriously, like listen to me carefully. When it says verily, verily, it's uh, repeating the urgency, like listen to me. I guess by the day standard, we would probably get very close to somebody and say, listen, I want to tell you something. But to again, bow down thine ear to me. Not literally, of course, because of course, God the Father doesn't have physical features. God the Holy Ghost doesn't have physical features. God the Son does, but not the Father or the Spirit. Bow down thine ear to me. Listen to me, dear Lord. Deliver me speedily, like right away. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. Hebrews 3 speaks about Christ being our house and uh, how Moses was a good foundation, but the Messiah is a greater, more substantial foundation. Bow down thine ear to me, deliver me speedily, be thou my strong rock. Of course, Christ is a rock of all ages, for a house of defence to save me. Matthew 7 speaks about when a flood arise, arises, and it's strong winds and stormy weather, an earthquake starts to uh, kick off, as it were, and those whose houses are built on the rock of all ages will be fine untouched and those that have built their homes on the sand would of course collapse that's the same imagery here's a picture of a man late in life maybe late 60s still struggling with the old man and i want to discuss that this morning he's in need of great help like straight away bow down thine ear to me this is anthropomorphical language deliver me speedily like right away be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me look at it my strong rock do i put my trust let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. This goes back to probably David's state, not his standing. He was a saved man, of course, but the old nature never left him. Look at verse 3. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. It's all about Jehovah. Jehovah comes for the Jews. He picks them out, the Jewish people. It starts with uh, Jacob, of course, and ends with Jesus. And for Two and a half, three thousand years, nearly three and a half thousand years to be more precise. Jesus is uh, dealing with the Jews. Of course, Jesus being the second member of the Trinity, Jehovah uh, specifically is dealing with the Jews, but probably in the person of Jesus. And for three and a half thousand years, the Jews go from bad to worse. Every generation ends in apostasy. And of course, the generation that we are living in today will also end in apostasy. This is the Laodicea era. For thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake lead me and guide me. Because of the sake of Jehovah, because of his promise to David and co, he would uh, overlook the, the, uh, the sins of the Jews for generations. He would allow them to have two temples. The first was built, of course, under Solomon, the son of David. That was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. The second was uh, built or finished off uh, under King Herod, of course. That was destroyed in 70 AD. But because of the sake of Jehovah, because of the sake of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, he has allowed the Jews to continue to live and breathe. In fact, one of the great proofs that Jehovah is real and that the Jews are the chosen race is the fact that they are still living today. Even after the last, what, two weeks of bombs going off in Israel, of rockets being fired in their thousands uh, from Gaza, thanks to Iranian help, thanks to Russian-built uh, weapons, Jews uh, running for cover, pressure from the West, like you wouldn't possibly imagine, in spite of all that, the Jews were able to protect themselves. But one day, Jehovah will return and he will punish many of the unbelieving Jews. And of course, he will deal with the uh, Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Bilderbergers, uh, all those wicked satanic Jews. Uh, but he'll also deal with all those evil satanic Gentiles as well. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust? Could be in reference to his initial faith in Jehovah, going back to when uh, Samuel would anoint him. But also in reference to his states in a daily basis, Paul wasn't ashamed because Paul knew that he was saved. He knew for sure that he was going to heaven upon death. But even Paul would wrestle with the old man and we we'll discuss that this morning. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust? You have to personally appropriate the atonement. Let me never be ashamed. That's a tall order. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock. For a house of defence to save me. When the floods come, Matthew chapter 7, I will be able to stand strong. I'll be like that palm tree, which we looked at many weeks ago, which, uh, although it blows in the wind, doesn't uh, blow out of control. It's as firm 
as could be uh, imagined. And it's a picture of a man who's upright, perfect and upright. Not sinless, but he's not double-minded. Uh, three again. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Fortress, pretty clear imagery, like a tower looking down. My rock, again the rock of all ages. Uh, Paul speaks about this in 1 Corinthians 10. And he speaks about the rock that the Jews followed, which of course was Jehovah, a theophany. And he says that rock which the Jews followed, is our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. That's a personal prayer. Going back to David's problems, prayers and praises, all coming together. In fact, one of my reference Bibles said that his enemies had, quote-unquote, mouth disease. I like that. Mm -hmm. Always shooting their mouths off against David and against Paul. They would uh, make fun of Paul's appearance. Uh, he speaks about that in Second Corinthians. They would criticize his uh, speech. They would uh, criticize his demeanor. They would find faults in his appearance, much like they would do with John the Baptist. And yet John the Baptist has gone down in history as one of the greatest people who ever lived. Christ said uh, there's nobody born better among women than John the Baptist. And of course, the Apostle Paul would write most of the New Testament. King David would write most of the Old Testament. And your enemies of uh, Paul, David and John were numerous. And yet who remembers those people today? Uh, 31.4 Pull me out to the net that they have laid privily for me. For thou art my strength. The imagery switches to David as, a, as an animal, if you will, like a deer. Uh, or like an animal about to be uh, pounced upon. If you watch these nature programs, and I come across them every so often online... It's always distressing to see a deer being pinned to the ground by a cheetah or an elephant being pinned to the ground by a tiger. I saw a clip a few weeks ago of a big tiger eating a crocodile. Jumped into this uh, stream, this river, and grabbed this 15, no, it wasn't a 15 foot, it's probably an 8 foot crocodile out of the lake and uh, jumped back onto the riverbank and climbed up high up on this hill and ate the crocodile. You couldn't imagine it. Never seen it. In my life before, I've seen many uh, wild animals kill each other, but I've never seen a big tiger jump into a lake, a fast-moving lake, get the crocodile and drag it out and devour it. So here, verse 4, pull me out of the net that they have laid privily, privately, for me, Old English for privately, like discreetly, uh, for thou art my strength. They were plotting to attack David. We're not sure what this incident uh, is all about. It does say, again in Psalm 31, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, no more background to it. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily or privately for me, for thou art my strength. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Keep your hand there and go to Luke 24. <laughs> Luke 24, which Patrick read at the beginning of uh, our live Lord's Day service. It's been a great blessing for me to go through the book of Psalms over the last 52 weeks, 12 months. Into thine hands I commit my spirit, thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Again, double application, and I'll discuss that shortly. Luke 24, I uh, didn't write the verse down, 23, excuse me, 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. He gave up the ghost, picturing his deity. Uh, John 2, he says he will raise himself from the dead. Galatians 1 says how the Father would raise him from the dead. Romans 8 says how the Holy Ghost will raise him from the dead. Keep your hand there on Luke 23 and go back to Psalm 31. Look at verse 5 in more detail. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. That's a greater David speaking. Thou hast redeemed me. That's the lesser David speaking. O Lord God of truth. You've got one verse, two people speaking. We call this double application. 2346 again. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice. Going back to spirit, possession or devil, possession. If you think back to the accounts in the Gospels when Christ came up against devil possessed people. How they spoke with a loud voice. Or when Elizabeth came into contact with Mary. She spoke with a loud voice, you got spirit possession, like the Holy Ghost, and devil possession, like the unholy ghost. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Go back to Psalm 31, look at verse uh, 6. I've hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. 
lying vanities like vain or empty idols. David would have a fit if he saw the Catholic Church today. He'd be just appalled to see idols all over the place. And of course, if you go to Anglican churches, it's not much better. They are known to attain idols and imagery. If you think about the Lutheran Church in America, they too like to dress up. They wear vestments, they have statues, they have pictures, images of Christ, Mary, and other so-called uh, people that are worthy of worship. Of course, Christ is worthy of worship. Don't misunderstand me, but he doesn't want to have images made of him. Mary is not worthy of worship, and she too doesn't want to have images made of her. But it goes back to man's carnal mind. He wants to believe in something. He has to believe in someone or something, and because he's carnal... What do they say? Seeing is believing. He wants to have something to get his hands on. And of course, when you do that, you fall into the terrible sin of idolatry. I have hated them, that regard, lying vanities. David was a typical alpha male. We discussed him many times over the last 52 weeks. Uh, he had many sins, which we'll discuss this morning, but he wasn't into idolatry. Unlike his son, Solomon, who was into everything, uh, David wasn't into idolatry. Paul struggled with the old man. That's found in Philippians 3 and uh, Romans 7. And I'll show you a few verses shortly from 1 Timothy. But Paul didn't struggle with the sin of idolatry. It's very rare to find an alpha male, spirit-filled man battling with the sin of idolatry. He may battle with pornography. He may battle with women. He may battle with an old nature, like a temper problem. He may battle uh, drinking, perhaps, or smoking, or stuff like that. But a true alpha male like David or Paul, take your pick. It's very rare to find me uh, to find messing around with statues, idols, images, so on and so forth. That's what we refer to as a beta male. I have hated, how about that? I have hated, not just disliked. I have hated them that regard lying vanities. But I trust in the Lord. Going back to verse 1. Look at 7. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy. For thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul in adversities. And has not shut me up into the hand of the enemy. Thou hast set my feet in a large room. In my father's house so many mansions. If it were not so I would have told you. Shut up in the sense of given me over. Or handed me over. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy. For thou hast considered my trouble. We're not sure what this particular incident is all about. But it's something which is bothering him. Thou hast known my soul. In adversities. We say our soul. Or we say my soul. Or I, I may say. My soul feels very heavy this morning. Or perhaps you might say, uh, my spirit feels suppressed uh, this morning. That's referring to our Adamic natures. That goes back to our daily struggles. I've hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. You've got a negative and a positive there. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. Considered in the sense of intervened, not just been aware of it, but dealt with it. Thou hast known my soul in adversities plural, and has not shut me up into the hand of the enemy, hasn't given me over to enemies like uh, Joseph would, uh, concerning the Ishmaelites, who uh, of course uh, took him off to Egypt. Thou hast set my feet in a large room, probably in reference to the uh, mansions found over in John 14. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief. Yea, my soul and my belly, body, soul and spirits, is in a bad state. Something is wrong here. We're not sure exactly what's going on. David's crisis has basically drained him. He is despised uh, by his opponents, deserted by his friends. He has become yesterday's man. On top of that, a frightening conspiracy threatens to overwhelm him. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble, like straight away, like right now, like this very moment. Mine eye, not eyes, mine eye is consumed with grief. This could also be in reference to what Paul struggled with in uh, 2 Corinthians. Paul's eyesight was causing him trouble. Uh, but here it says how his eye is consumed with grief. Yea, my soul and my belly. He's basically breaking down. This is a serious situation for him which could spiral out of control. Look at verse 10. For my life is spent with grief. And my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity. And my bones are consumed. Go to First Timothy chapter 1. Whatever David's problem was. It's uh, found in both testaments. Concerning the apostle Paul. And uh, we have to keep preaching. About the two natures of the believer. The two parts to the Christian's character. 
Uh, I don't care who you are or where you live or what your background is. If you are honest with yourself, you have an old nature. And I like to tease people occasionally and say uh, to speak to your wife if you need to be reminded or speak to your husband or your children or somebody who's close to you. And they will tell you very quickly all about your old nature. That's if you are a self-righteous, pious Pharisee. Uh, what did I say? First Timothy chapter 1. Uh, okay, here we go. First Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1. Uh, look at verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our Lord. Those of us which have appropriated the atonement, of course. Who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful. Put me into the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. 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 Injury. Causing pain and suffering. But I obtained mercy. Because I did it ignorantly, in unbelief. You couldn't say that about the Dominicans, could you? Or the Jesuits, or other so-called church leaders who would murder people, torture people. You couldn't say that about uh, Geneva, could you? When they burnt uh, Michael Servetus to death, they put him on a green tree, burnt him alive for, was it three to six hours? And old Johnny Calvin was saying to uh, Servetus, I'm doing, it, I'm doing it for your own good, he said. He spent the whole night before he killed Servetus. Uh, trying to convince him of his errors. And yes, of course, Servetus was a heretic. But of course, that doesn't uh, justify his murder, of course. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer. OMG, JC. It says in the book of Acts, how he got the Jews that believed on Jesus to blaspheme Jesus. I think the uh, Dominicans were good at doing that as well. They would get their people who were being tortured to death to blaspheme Christ. And they would say, you better swear that you believe in Holy Mother Church. And they would hold a rosary up or a crucifix. And they would say, kiss the crucifix, kiss the rosary, renounce your Protestant beliefs, you dirty heretics. Uh, believe on Holy Mother Church, all that nonsense. And you got these people being murdered to death, tortured to death. It was one account. It may have been John Huss when he was being murdered. And the guy said to Huss, please forgive me. And he said, that's okay. He said, just give me a hand. And old Huss is in a fire. It's burning in great pain. And he's, he's basically being burnt to death like Servetus. And this papist puts his hand on Huss's uh, heart. And Huss put his hand on the torturous heart. And he said, uh, you've got more problems than I have. Mm-hmm. And old John Huss uh, died like a martyr, a real man. Didn't panic. But here, Paul is looking back on his life as a blasphemer, as a persecutor, and injurious, injurious, like I say, caused great injury. But I obtained mercy positive because I did it ignorantly, in unbelief. But look at verse 14 and 15. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world... To save sinners of whom I am chief. Present tense. Go back to Psalm 31. Look at 9 again. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. And he will. If I am in trouble, he knows that. Mine eye is consumed with grief. He understands that. Yea, my soul and my belly, body, soul and spirit. His body is basically falling apart. We're not told what's going on. But no doubt. This goes back to David's old nature. 11. I'll make it 10 first of all. Uh, for my life is spent with grief. And my years with sighing. This is hard to understand. I mean, David's life was a good life. He wasn't ill all of his life. If you think about people who have been sick all of their life, born with a disability, uh, can't see, they can't hear, they can't speak, they are disabled, can't get out of bed in the morning, have to have nurses come and uh, change them or turn them over so their skin doesn't stick to the bed or they can't walk around or they are incontinent uh, or they are swelling up all of the time or they're bleeding all of the time. That's a terrible life, isn't it? That wasn't David's problem. For my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. So this goes back to double application. It has to. This is in reference to the greater David. He came to suffer for the sins of the world. It says he was a man acquainted with grief, sorrows, so on and so forth. Only once it would say he uh, rejoiced. For my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. Greater David, colon, my strength faileth because of mine iniquity, lesser David. And my bones are consumed. That goes back, of course, to uh, King David. Go back to First Timothy. First Timothy uh, chapter 1. One of the great uh, tragedies in recent years is a lack of good quality Bible teaching. Uh, faithful men of God getting up and explaining the two natures of the believer. 
how they struggle, how we all struggle, some with more sins than others, but we all have sins that we struggle with. And when you don't find a pastor who tells you that, or when you fail to find somebody who levels with you, you're dealing with either a liar, a novice, or a charlatan. But uh, I'm with Paul in verse 15. I am the chief of sinners, of whom I am chief, in the present tense. Go to uh, 524. Some end sins are open beforehand, going before the judgments, and some men they follow after. You get two groups of people, saved of course. One will uh, have their sins splashed all over the place, and you'll know all about it. And when they die, they go to the judgment seats if they are saved. Some are like Rabbi Zacharias, perhaps. And somebody else will die whose uh, life was outwardly good, but perhaps not inwardly. And they have to answer for their sins at the judgment seat. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment, but some men they follow after. Likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are without, excuse me, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Two groups of people. Go back to Psalm 31. Look at verse 10 one more time. For my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. Grief, sighing. He's in a terrible state, basically. He's hemmed in on every side, not knowing if he's coming or going. For my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity, present tense, and my bones are consumed. Go to uh, Daniel chapter 9. So I've shown you uh, David's situation. I've shown you Paul's situation, how I am, present tense, a chief of sinners. And I'll show you somebody else's sinful nature, which may surprise you. I sat down, like I say, over the last couple of mornings to read through the book of Daniel. I was trying to find a verse which speaks about the Jew being being hidden during the tribulation. And uh, we get time, i read it this morning, if not next week. It was interesting to read about uh, Daniel and his struggle with sin as well. Daniel 9, Daniel 9, uh, look at verse uh, 20. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. What's going on, Daniel? Why are you sinning? You shouldn't sin. That's what they say, isn't it? Some of the most uh, pious people that you see online, I won't name them, but they like to say they don't sin and they don't plan on sinning anytime soon. There's something wrong with those people. There's something not right with their spirits. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, do you pray for your people? Are you an American? Do you pray for your people in America? Are you British? Do you pray for your people in Britain? Are you French or Spanish or German or Dutch? Do you pray for your people? Pray for your own sin? You're told to do so in First John chapter 1. Do you pray for your own people? This goes back to Job. We discussed him over the last couple of weeks. Praying in advance for his family, sacrificing animals, because he thought his kids might sin and curse God. Do you do that? You marry people. Do you pray together every morning for your children? Do you pray in advance so that they won't sin against God? Do you fast? Do you afflict yourself? Do you pray for your country? You look at someone like Job, a remarkable man. Puts most of us to shame. You've got three people in scripture. You've got Noah. You've got uh, Job. And you've got Daniel. Uh, mentioned very favorably in the book of Ezekiel. And those three men all had sin problems. And yet Job, one of the greatest out of the three, would pray in advance, would fast in advance, would say to the Lord, whatever you do, Lord, please don't punish my son or my daughter or both. I know how wicked they are. I wonder how many parents do that every single morning. I mean, every single morning before you go off to work in the morning. Do you pray with your wives? Do you pray with your husbands? Do you fast for your children? Why don't you do that if you're married, if you have children? Why don't you always do that if you're married and if you have children? I mean, Job did it. And one day the devil said to the Lord, let me work him over. And he said to the devil, that's fine, but you can't kill him. And one day the devil looked at uh, Peter and said to the Lord, let me work him over. He said, that's fine, but don't kill him. And Peter was in a real spin, as was Job, but they held firm. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin, going back to David's sin, uh, going back to Paul's sin, going back to my sin and your sin, going back to John Calvin's sin, as he was torturing Michael Servetus to death. No, not directly, of course, indirectly. Hitler didn't murder anybody directly, only indirectly. Stalin probably did murder people directly, mm. but later in life, indirectly. Confessing my sin and the sin of my people. John says, if we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar, and the truth is not in us, but if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all divine righteousness. Before the Lord my God and the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. I'll give you one more. Go to Daniel 10. Daniel 10 and look at verse 11. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So it's like this. You've got someone like uh, Samson and Daniel. Daniel was inwardly and outwardly righteous, where Samson was neither. And yet both were saved, and both are in heaven today. It goes back to being a Jew, living back in the days of Samson, and seeing him hanging around with prostitutes, immoral women, killing people left, right and centre, causing the Jews multiple problems. And he was an embarrassment to Israel, and he served Israel for 20 years. And towards the end of his life, of course, you know the story, they took his eyes out. They said to him, uh, let him make sport for us. And he was entertaining the uh, Philistines. And of course, he knew that his time was up. Turned to the Lord, and the Lord turned to him. And of course, he committed suicide. But the point is this. If you looked at Samson, you'd say, is he really a son of Israel? Is he really one of us? Is he a holy, godly, consecrated man? No, he's not. You'd probably say he's not really a proper Jew. He's carnal, so on and so forth. Yes, he was carnal, but he was saved. In heaven today, you've got someone like Daniel, inwardly righteous, outwardly righteous. And yet, I briefly profiled him yesterday. Very interesting. When he comes into contact with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 2, it says how Nebuchadnezzar fell at his feet, worshipped Daniel. Daniel doesn't say a word. And after being promoted, he's given gold and clothing and jewelry, so on and so forth, which he accepts. But when Belshazzar comes along, and starts to commend Daniel, and says, I'll make you the third in the kingdom. He says, he doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. He saw something in Belshazzar that he didn't see in his father, Nebuchadnezzar. Two sons of Israel, both saved. One was carnal, one was not. Going back to Lot being carnal. And so too was Abraham, and uh, all these so-called greats. And they are greats, of course. But uh, sometimes they are offered up as being almost uh, spotless, sinless. And of course they were not. Go back to 9.20 again. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin, and the sin of my people Israel, you dirty man, Daniel. You're a sinner, Daniel. Why are you still sinning, Daniel? You shouldn't be sinning. What do they say in First John chapter 3? He that sins is of the devil. And they use that quote and that verse from First John chapter 3 to talk you out of your salvation. Of course, First John chapter 3 has a double application concerning your new birth and also concerning your millennial state. But no time to discuss that this morning. Confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, intercession, presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. And go back to 10, 11 again. O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. You mean God loves sinners? Yes, he loves sinners. Standing in state. I wish you could get that, people. Standing in state. O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Not just beloved, greatly beloved. 11. Thou dost set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God. Go back to Psalm 31. Standing a state, if you don't understand it, you have no business being a teacher, a preacher. If you think that when you become a Christian, you don't sin any longer, you are living in cuckoo land, you don't understand reality, and if you think you are still holy and righteous, put yourself next to Daniel, who was uh, a eunuch. Put yourself next to uh, David, who was a king. Put yourself next to the Apostle Paul, uh, who was an apostle. And, and ask yourself this, are you better than those three people? And if you still think you are, you need to go to the mental institution, the asylum centre. Psalm 31, look at verse 10 again. For my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. I'm sure some of David's days were difficult, but not many. For the most part, he was king over Israel and Judah. The Jews would unite behind him, as they were behind the greater David during the millennial kingdom. But for a period of time... He was struggling for a period of time. He was being chastened for his iniquity. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity. The old boy is still sinning. He's nearly 70. Hasn't conquered the old nature. And again, I like to keep reminding people about this because I see clips online 
and I hear preachers get up in their pulpit and preach a very pious message, which I know impresses many people. A lot of your Calvinist channels on YouTube are run by some very pious people, but the truth of the matter is these guys don't live in the real world. These guys have never had jobs. These guys have no understanding of what it's like to have a boss over them, or be married to an unsaved person, or have lost children. And they preach this pious message, and they raise Christ up so high that you can't reach him. It may have been 15 years ago, I heard an old sermon by J. Vernon McGee, hadn't been saved very long, and it was a wonderful message. And he was speaking about uh, some of his Calvinist friends that went to uh, seminary, and they got into the ministry, became very successful uh, preachers and pastors. And he said the problem was all those guys were Calvinists. And he said the problem was that they raised Christ up so high that uh, you couldn't reach Christ. And I thought that's a good point. If you raise him too high, if you uh, elevate him too high, we can't reach him. And do you realize how serious that is? If we can't reach him, then we can't be saved. That's why it says how Christ uh, became a sin offering. And it says how he uh, came to seek and to save that which was lost. So I like to keep Christ at the bottom of the shelf, as they say in the uh, local supermarket analogy, where you can reach him, not have to reach up, but reach down. And more importantly, he reaches us. We don't reach him. For my life is spent with grief. I'm a years with sighing. My strength fadeth because of mine iniquity. And my bones are consumed. Christ's bones were in great agony as he was hanging on a cross. It says how his bones looked and stared upon him. But not one bone was broken. So I'll close it there in verse 10. This has been week 52 if you care to know. And by the grace of God we have now got over 33 hours recorded. And these verses deal with David as a king. But also as a person. He was a real man. He was a man's man. He's struggling with his sin. And again if you are... A saved person struggling with sin. You're in good company. You're in the same boat as was Daniel. And you are in the same boat as was the Apostle Paul. And uh, if you are losing hope, don't. If you are struggling and feel like you are sinking, start swimming. Christ will get you to the other end of the lake. He will rescue you. You're already saved, of course. uh, But you're in good company. You've got David to fall back on. You've got Job and also Noah who got intoxicated. And uh, the Apostle Paul, who was whipped and beaten and was punished by the Lord for going against the Lord. He was told not to go to Jerusalem, and he did. And the Lord still used his uh, disobedience, and he'll use your disobedience for your own good. That, of course, is Romans 8, 28. Psalm 31, Psalm 31. Look at verse 1 again, if you will. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Keep your hand and go to Joel uh, chapter 2. Shame is a terrible thing. They say that when a person takes their own life, uh, they do so because of the shame that they are living with. If you speak against uh, LGBT, for example, uh, you are condemned for that. Or if you speak against uh, homosexuality in general, or whatever is wrong, whatever is anti-scriptural, or what they say is uh, that uh, you have caused people to feel uh, insecure. You have hurt people, basically. You have damaged people. <coughs> You've hurt their feelings, uh, basically. But of course, it's not like that. When a person harms himself, when a person takes their own life, they do so because of their own conscience, of course. Joel chapter 2 is a good place to go to as a cross-reference. Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 2. Look at verse uh, 26, if you will. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, that I dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. You say, what would Israel be ashamed about? Idolatry, witchcraft, Kabbalahism, marrying Gentiles, uh, treating fellow Jews badly. Sin and shame will ruin people. Sin and shame results many times in addictions to drug abuse, alcoholism, uh, even overeating, uh, gluttony, uh, addictions to this and that. Uh, like the old joke used to say, uh, he drinks to forget, and they said, uh, what are you trying to forget? And they said, he doesn't know, he's already forgotten. Very funny, but of course it's not very funny. People are trying to bury their shame. And ye shall eat in plenty, millennial reign of course, and be satisfied. Very few people are satisfied. What would uh, the Rolling Stones say? I get no satisfaction. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. As of right now, Jews all over the world are for the most part unsaved, living in unbelief, doing their own thing. 
I'm told you can be an atheist Jew and still be a Jew. I'm told you can be a Buddhist Jew and still be a Jew. I'm told you can be a Masonic Jew and still be a Jew. And every time you hear about such Jews living in such a way, they are shaming themselves. And of course, their ancestry. Look at verse 27. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, thousand year reign, of course, and that I am the Lord, your God. And none else are my people. My people and my people shall never be ashamed. Go back to Psalm 31. So this will be volume 2. This will be week 53. Looking at probably the greatest book in the Old Testament when it comes to help and relief. Encouragement. Uh, Christians do get down. Christians do suffer with depression. If you think about Elijah, he got down, he got depressed. Or suicidal. If you think about Jonah. And we spent many weeks profiling him. He got down, he got distressed, and uh, he was in a bad state for a period of time. It's been said that the Apostle Paul suffered with clinical depression. Not sure about that myself, but he was a very emotional man. So if you are down this morning, if you feel under par this morning, if you don't feel 100% this morning, then read the book of Psalms. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Going back to imputation, of course. Look at verse 6 again. Make it verse 5, excuse me. Verse 5 again. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. It speaks about hand in the singular sense. And yet in Luke 23, it speaks about hands in the plurality sense. or in the plural sense. So into thine hands, into thine hands I commend my spirit. Christ is speaking to his father, of course. But here David is speaking to his Lord and his master going back to the hand of the Lord. Reaches out all day long to a disobedient and gain same people. The hand of the Lord. Christ is Jehovah's right hand man. They say uh, he's my right hand man. They say he will succeed me when I retire. Not his literal right hand man. But uh, he's in a position of authority. In a position of power of course. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me. O Lord God of truth. That's a wonderful verse to look at this morning. Jump down to verse 11. I was approached among all mine enemies, but especially among my neighbours, and a fear to mine acquaintance. They that did see me without fled from me. Keep your hand there and go to Mark chapter 14. Your friends will either stand with you or abandon you when the going gets tough. When I first got saved, I had a group of friends, and I started to witness to them. And I witnessed to all of my family, witnessed to all of my workmates. Letters were sent out, uh... I went door to door in some uh, some cases, trying to witness to people that I knew. And after witnessing to all that I knew, the uh, doors were shut in my face. Uh, look at Mark fourteen fifteen, And they all forsook him and fled. Apart from John and the women, of course. Go back to Psalm 31, look at 11 again. I was a reproach, like I was despised, among all mine enemies. So once again, it's David speaking, the lesser David, but also the greater David. But especially among my neighbours, they that did see me without fled from me. If I go back to Mark, this time go to Mark chapter 3. I think it's Mark chapter 3. It's always hard witnessing to your family. And in Mark, uh, I think it's Mark 3. Yeah, it's Mark 3, Mark 3. This is what the Lord was up against. Mark 3, Mark 3. Uh, look at verse 21. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him. For they said, he is beside himself. That's the Lord's own family. Saying he's lost his mind. Go back to Psalm 31. He needs to be counseled. He needs to be helped. He needs to be taken care of. He needs to be taken under, taken under somebody's wing. And of course it starts off with the Lord witnessing to his friends and family. It wasn't easy of course. His own brothers would reject him. John chapter 7. Probably his sisters as well. And yet, quick footnote, every film I've ever watched, every film, including the new Chosen uh, series, every single film decides to overlook his brothers and sisters. They follow the Catholic line, of course. I was a reproach among all mine enemies, 3111, but especially among my neighbours, going back to Mark 14, Mark chapter 3, friends and family, Thought he had lost his mind. Friends and family had no real comprehension of, as to Christ's ministry. Even his mother Mary seemed to fail at times to grasp uh, what was going on when he went to Jerusalem with his parents and was left in the temple with the doctors. And a fear to mine acquaintance, probably going back to the apostles, 
For here also reference to David's acquaintance. They that did see me without, they that saw me outside, fled from me. When the going got tough, the tough got going, and Christ was alone, like I say, but of course his father was with him. David was left alone, but his father was with him. Moses was left alone, but his father was with him. So that's the context. It's David, the lesser David, but it's David, the greater David. And sometimes one verse gives you two applications. But if you don't study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, if you don't study this book, you won't be able to deal you won't be able to deal with those that come against this book. I heard a preacher a year before last make a very valid point, a very worrying point, and he said this, he said that we, the church, i.e. the elders or leaders in the church, have done a terrible job uh, preparing the next generation to go into the world. And he said, I've seen many Islamic apologists over the years uh, put Christians on the spots, and your average Christian cannot respond to the arguments from the Mohammedans. He's absolutely right, they can't. Your average Christian goes to uh, college or university, and after four or five minutes of arriving at such a place, are introduced to uh, evolutionary teachers, uh, lecturers, most are Marxist, and of course within five minutes the Christian is put on the spots and your average Christian cannot handle it. Hasn't been trained in the art of hermeneutics, apologetics, and of course they start to backslide. They start to question their religion, and it's very rare when somebody puts those people on the spot and turns the screws and says they're Marxist, professes, you follow Karl Marx, do you, a Freemason, who saw his own family starve to death because he was too lazy to work, one of his kids took his own life, or you follow Charles Darwin, do you? Again, a couple of his kids starved to death, was a Freemason. If you find yourself uh, on the back foot, if you are at college or at university, turn the screws, turn the tables, put the pressure on those that are coming against you. I guarantee you, if you spend just five minutes researching Nietzsche, uh, Karl Marx, Charles Darwin, Huxley, all those people, uh, you'll find some pretty... Uh, damning material which you can use against your professors, your lecturers. They laugh at us. They make fun of us, but if you research their idols and attack their idols, they don't like it. You can shut their mouths, of course, but do it in love. Don't do it in anger. If I was a reproach, I was a reproach among all my enemies. You should have enemies if you are a Christian, and uh, if you haven't, you will. Just keep preaching. But especially among my neighbours, and a fear to mine acquaintance. They that did see me without fled from me. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I am like a broken vessel. We say out of sight, out of mind. So again, when you first read these verses, you think to yourself, David must have had a very difficult life. But of course, it's not David. It's a great David. Only once it says how Jesus would rejoice. Most of the time, he is a man acquainted with sorrows and grief. I won't say he was a very sad man all of the time. I'm sure that he wasn't. I'm sure he was happy and upright and upbeat confident and uh, jolly and uh, content but his ministry was a tough one due to the sin of the world being put on his shoulders of course i am forgotten as a dead man out of mind i'm like a broken vessel like a broken body of course his body was broken uh, that's what we do after the service every sunday we break bread and we break bread in remembrance of the death of the lord jesus christ just yesterday oddly enough we're doing street work got our new uh, sign out, put it on the street, and there was a guy sitting opposite us, mid to late 30s, bit of a lout, mm. and he shouted over, Jesus, the body of Jesus, <clears throat> probably a Catholic, and I was going to say, I said to myself, if he says it again, I'll go over to him and have a word with him, not confrontationally, that doesn't work on the street, but uh, I would have put a bit of pressure on him, mm. just a bit of pressure, and I would have said to him, it's always funny, isn't it, how Jesus gets mocked and scoffed, but never the Freemasons. Going back to my opening comments, witchcraft, the Illuminati, Wicca, black magic, white magic. You don't find many movies, do you, made to ridicule such a belief, and yet it is endemic. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I'm like a broken vessel. For I've heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. Slander is what you speak. Libel is what you write. Late last week, a story broke about a politician in Northern Ireland, the former First Minister, in <clears throat> fact, a very powerful woman, and uh, she was slandered, and then she sued for libel, and basically the background to it, uh, she was head of the DUP, a Northern Ireland party, she was the First Minister, the most powerful politician in Northern Ireland, up until she stood down, week before last, I think it was, and a 
doctor in the UK, a homosexual doctor in the UK, thought he'd have some fun mm. with uh, this politician by the name of Mrs. Foster. And he said basically she was having an affair, which of course she wasn't. And he was so confident he could get away with it that he typed all this stuff out on Twitter. And basically she took him to court. And it was very interesting to follow this case. And I've been following it over the last few weeks. And I was of the belief that she would probably lose uh, due to the current climate. But I was pleasantly surprised. Mm. She won her case against him. She sued him for libel. On top of that, he had to pay her £125,000 in damages. And I think when you sue in court and win, you have to pay court costs. You have to pay for the barristers on both sides of the spectrum. And you have to pay for the cost of the court sitting. So I would imagine that this doctor by the name of Christian Jason, Jason, I think he pronounced his name, J-E-S-E-N, Jason, Jason, Jason. I would imagine that by the end of the day... He would be probably half a million pounds out of pocket. Serves him right, of course. Somebody once said this. If you want to say something about somebody, just be sure or be careful that if you can't back it up in court, don't say it. What you can do is say allegedly. Allegedly this happened or allegedly that happened. That one English word allegedly found in the Gospel of Luke and also the Book of Acts. Allegedly, like Acts chapter 1, that word allegedly gives you legal cover. If you ever find yourself being sued... And say to the court, well, I only alleged it. I didn't say it definitely happened. But this doctor got egg on his face, and rightly so. For I've heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. That term fear was on every side is found in the book of Jeremiah, incidentally, like four times. Think back to the book of, of uh, Genesis, when Jacob and his sons were retreating after his sons murdered uh, the rapist of their sister and also murdered all of his uh, family. It was a bloodbath. And it speaks about uh, how fear wasn't allowed to, how fear followed them, but fear wasn't allowed to overtake them, a slight abbreviation, a paraphrase. But basically, Jacob was panicking, trying to get his kids out of town, because, of course, the locals were hot on their heels. If I've heard the slander of many, going back to this sodomite doctor slandering Arlene Foster, or Christians in general, fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. Go to John chapter 11. The court ruled in uh, Mrs. Foster's favour and the judge reprimanded, uh, I think it's Jason, Jason, I can't quite pronounce his name, can't quite remember the pronunciation of his name. We'll call him Christian, though he's no Christian. Mm. That's his first name. And the judge said to Christian, he said, uh, you, are, uh, you, you, you are in the wrong, basically, and you should be ashamed of yourself. What you said online wasn't true. You rubbished a good woman's character. And she had to tell her elderly mother that she was taking you to court. You caused her embarrassment, alarm and, and uh, distress. And because of that, I'm ruling in her favour. And even if he goes to the appeal court, and he probably will, he won't win. And have to pay more money uh, in damages and legal fees. So again, uh, slander is what you speak, or slander is what you say. Libel is what you write. Last month, when uh, Prince Philip died, I was listening to a British commentator who was alluding to the fact that Charles and also Philip, but especially uh, Philip, uh, had relations with uh, people like uh, Jimmy Savile, a known uh, paedophile, and also Charles, who had links to Jimmy Savile, not to mention Bishop Bull. And of course, Bishop Bull, Peter Bull, was a bishop in the Church of England, and uh, Charles had to go to court and basically defend himself because Bull was found guilty of paedophilia. Went to prison for a long period of time, he abused many novices who were training for the priesthood. And uh, when uh, Philip died, I think only one commentator alluded, alleged, that Philip had links to uh, people like Jimmy Savile, very close to him, as was uh, Mrs. Thatcher's husband. And uh, Prince Charles was also close to Savile, as was uh, Mrs. Thatcher, and also Mr. Thatcher. Mm. You see, it's like this. You pick your friends carefully. If I was to hang around with... Marilyn Manson, for example, or if I was to hang around with, I don't know, uh, Beyonce or Jay-Z or Kanye West or Katy Perry or Lady Gaga or some of those reprobates, uh, you'd say to yourself, what does James have in common with those people? And of course, the reality would be that I am one of those people, right? If you're hanging around with gangsters, mobsters, if you're, ha- if you're hanging around with uh, homosexuals or lesbians, if you're hanging around with uh, Freemasons and witches... If you're hanging around with paedophiles, then perhaps you are one yourself. 
John 11, John 11, look at verse uh, 50. Uh, Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Go back to Psalm 31. For I've heard the slander of many, not just David, the less, but David the greater. Fear was on every side. I think Christ was fearful, but David probably was. While they took counsel together against me, John chapter 11, they devised to take away my life. I don't think David's enemies were plotting to kill him. I know his son, Absalom, would attempt to do so in a botched and amateur coup d'etat. But of course, when it came to the greater David, uh, yes, they were allowed to gather together. Pilate and Herod came together with the apostate Jewish leaders. And of course, that's an unholy alliance. They would say, we have no king but Caesar, going back to their shame. And Israel is in shame today. Uh, Most Israeli politicians are liberal, secular, Masonic, pro-LGBT. I'm told that Israel is the most pro-LGBT country in the Middle East. I can well believe it. They have uh, sodomite parades every year. Or paid by the taxpayer, of course. And that shame is uh, being used against them by their Islamic neighbours. You see, it's like this. Over the years I've discussed this. If you look at uh, uh, Muslim leaders in the so-called Palestinian territories or countries like Egypt or, I don't know, Lebanon or Kuwait, for example, Saudi Arabia, Iran. Uh, whenever their leaders go on, go on uh, camera, they always thank Allah. Have you noticed that? They thank their God for this, they thank him for that. And they mention him maybe five or six, seven or eight, nine or ten times. Especially uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, and all those Islamic terrorists in the Palestinian territories. Always thank Allah for this, Allah for that. And yet when the Israeli premier goes on television, doesn't mention God once. And that's worrying, isn't it? Has a star of David behind him, which we know has dubious links. You say, why am I saying all of this? Well, I'm saying all of this because it goes back to Israel's shame. Which one day the Lord will take away. Joel chapter 2, when the Jew turns to Jesus, of course. For I've heard the slander of many people gossiping against me, making fun of me, uh, saying things that aren't true. Fear was on every side, even causing my friends and family to panic, to worry, going back to Mark chapter 3. He is beside himself. While they took counsel together against me, John 11, they devised to take away my life. Let's silence him. Let's shut him up. Let's put the uh, fear of God into him. But before we do that, let's kill him. That's what they did during the uh, days of the Inquisition. In fact, when they were torturing people to death during the days of the Inquisition, they would pray over their tools. They'd say to the Lord, please bless our instruments. Allow us to do a good job here. Allow us to uh, quickly cut his head off. Bless the saws, bless the chisels, bless the hammers. All that nonsense. Look at 14, would you say? Wicked. Wicked indeed. Mm. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my God. Go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We try to be balanced at this ministry. We do speak against Catholics, Catholicism specifically. A your average Catholic is a victim, of course, to their church system. Have no idea what they are a part of. And we speak against the Inquisition and the uh, Crusades, more of the Inquisition. Terrible period. And we try to balance it with what took place in Geneva or what took place in America when they were killing witches. Not that many, incidentally. I think I heard one figure that more witches killed one another. Mm than Christians killing witches. But we do try to balance uh, when we preach and when we teach and when we appraise history. But I trusted in thee, O Lord, positive. I said, thou art my God. Going back to verse 1. In thee, O Lord, I put my trust. In God we trust. In God I trust. But I trusted in thee, O Lord, I said, thou art my God. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Uh, Titus chapter 2. Look at verse 13. Uh, doesn't it right? Titus. It's not what I wanted actually. I've got Titus 2 here. Uh, I think it's Titus 1, excuse me. Uh, no, but I'll give it to you anyway. Titus 1 13. This isn't the verse that I wanted. Uh, Titus 1 13. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. That wasn't the verse that I wanted. In fact, it was uh, Titus 2, excuse me. Uh, Titus 2, written it down. Didn't look right the first time. Titus 2, 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing 
of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. But I trusted in thee, O Lord, past tense. But I trusted in thee. It's a personal thing. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my God. Look for that blessed hope, rapture, of course, and the glorious appearing of the great God, El Gabor. Going back to uh, the Old Testament, El Gabor, the great God, the mighty God. This is a great verse for the deity of Christ and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, nobody else would or could, that he might redeem us from all, all iniquity. One of my biggest beefs with the Church of Rome is they underplay uh, Christ's atonement. They turn the Eucharist into an idol. And other churches like to underplay uh, the Lord's sacrifice, but the Church of Rome turned it into an idol, whereas others have abolished it altogether. But the truth of the matter is that when he died on a cross, he would say, it is finished. He wouldn't say, I am finished, but he would say, it is finished, denoting that mission was accomplished. That he might redeem us from all iniquity, I mean every particular sin, I won't list them all this morning, but every particular sin, and purifying to himself a peculiar people, that word peculiar, when you use it today, means slightly odd, slightly uh, bizarre, I suppose. If you think about those of us that do street work, uh, we like to do that, and we feel blessed to be able to do that. So people look at us as if we are somewhat peculiar. That's fine, though, because that's what it should be. You're told to suffer the reproach of Christ outside of the gate. You're told to be different. You're told to not fit in with the crowd. And if you preach and teach, or go into the streets especially, you are a peculiar person. But the word peculiar, in its original context, means holy. It means special, it means sacred. Who gave himself for us, substitutionary atonement, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous, zealous of good works. Going back to Ephesians chapter 2, saved by grace through faith, unto good works. And unfortunately the Church of Rome and most other churches fail to understand this and they make it very uh, complicated for a lot of people. And by doing so they put works ahead of the gospel and people think they are saved by their faith and their works. And of course they are not. Go back to Psalm 31. Go back to verse 5 again. Into thine hand, singular of course, I commit my spirit. Also found over in the Gospel of Luke 23. Picturing Christ giving up the ghost. And of course he gave up the ghost because of course he is God. You have no idea when you will die. Yes you can commit suicide like many cowards do. Uh, but apart from people com uh, committing suicide, most people have no idea how or when they will die. It goes back to when you were first conceived. You had no say in your conception. You had no say in your uh, gender or race or what have you. That was down to your parents, of course. But even then, it wasn't down to your parents. It was down to the grace of God. Whether you be born a boy or a girl, black or white, uh, oriental or what have you, and uh, all these things were out of your hands, going back to the atonement. You have no role to play in the atonement. Christ has already been sacrificed up for all of our sins. All you can do, all I can do, all any of us can do, is either receive Christ or reject him. Go back to verse 10 again. For my life is spent with grief. Grief, that's a powerful word, grief. That's what causes people to commit suicide. That's what causes people to cut themselves. Going back to my earlier comments, most people that cut themselves harm themselves. What do they call that? Self-harming. Most that do that do so because they can't live with themselves. It's not because of us. It's because of them. If you're living an abnormal life, don't blame us. If you can't live with yourself, if you're worn down with grief, and my years with sighing, or is sighing, uh, carrying the weight of the world in his shoulders, my strength faileth because of mine iniquity, not the greater David, of course, but the lesser David, and my bones are consumed. But verse 14 again, and we'll close on a positive note. But I trusted in thee, O Lord, I said, thou art my God. So we'll close it there. I'll pick up next week in verse 15. Once again, you see how these things are moving. You see how David is going from... Good to bad, in fact, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, 7, 8 are positive. But verses 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 and beyond, things are bad. His mood has switched. His mood has changed. Going back to Paul being an emotional man, as was uh, Elijah and also Jonah. In fact, most of the prophets were emotional people, Jeremiah especially. But it shows that even the greats can go from high to low very quickly. And if you're not careful, you can uh, just lose your mind temporarily and do terrible things. And of course, the worst thing that you could do is commit suicide. A terrible subject. But uh, to avoid that ever happening, get into the Word of God. If you're saved, read it each and every day. And if you're not saved, get saved. 
and uh, claim verse 14 for yourself. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my God. This will be week three, looking at Psalm 31. We've looked at David, Samson and Daniel, three different Jewish gentlemen, uh, so-called white privilege, quote unquote, but don't get me on that. And it's been interesting over the last two weeks, this will be week three, like I say, looking at uh, these three gentlemen who all made their mark, had old natures, new natures, I won't discuss that this morning. But once again, Psalm 31 is concerning King David, a prayer of despair. 31.15 My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies, and from them that persecute me. Again, thy hand, not hands. Going back to five, into thine hand. But of course, the term hand, like right hand man, or he has a strong hand, denotes power. It denotes a position of authority. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies, and from them that persecute me. So once again, we're not told specifically what David's problem was. But if it's in to go by, he's probably living a good godly life for the most part, trying to make a difference. And yet at the same time, he's a sinful man. He's a carnal man. And of course, if you walk in the flesh, you commit the sins of the flesh. But if you walk in the spirit, you don't commit the sins of the flesh. We are our own worst enemies. We've also looked at uh, Israel's uh, shame, her sin, her shame of rejecting Jesus and embracing anyone or anything you see it's like this if you want to go to heaven receive jesus you want to go to hell reject jesus it's as simple as that believe in anything or anyone apart from jesus and you're good to go to hell upon death but if you want to go to heaven upon death receive him believe on him israel has been stained with the sin of idolatry and it's always interesting you think about famous people who suffer uh, i say interesting that's probably not the right word but it's always intriguing i guess if you profile people who have tortured lives, I remember years ago speaking to a brother about uh, Charles Spurgeon, and he was a very emotional man, Spurgeon, we discussed him many times over the years, suffered with bipolar, and was very up and down, would go to the continent to recover, to recuperate, and uh, this elderly brother who's now with the Lord made a very good point, he said, I think one of the reasons why Spurgeon uh, was so emotional, uh, was so tortured, was because of his lifestyle, he was a very wealthy man of course, had uh, property on the continent, would indulge himself, and I thought, yeah, that's a pretty good reason, pretty good explanation to explain a Spurgeon's torturous behaviour. Of course, David was a king, a very wealthy man, obviously, as are all kings, all members of the royal family, and of course, jealousy also plays a part of that. So it's interesting and also intriguing if you profile famous people, like I say, as to why they suffer so much. It seems to me that the more you have, uh, the more unhappy you are, and the less you have, the more happy you are. My times are in thy hand, David speaking, about his Lord, of course, thy hand, going back to into thy hand, into thine hand, I commit my spirit. My times are in thy hand, deliver me from the hand of mine enemies, and from them that persecute me. Partly in reference to King Saul, David's father-in-law, always pursuing him. And of course, Saul is a type of the Antichrist, David is a type of the Christ. And this constant battle between the two family lines... But normally families, if they are popular, if they are powerful, uh, will be in dispute amongst each other. If you ever study the Illuminati bloodlines, there are 13. And of course those bloodlines uh, infuse into other bloodlines, which infuse into other bloodlines. Up until probably 50 years ago, if you wanted to marry into the royal family, you had to be of a particular bloodline. Not just in Britain, but on the continent. Uh, Now it doesn't seem to be the case. You can marry a commoner. I know in Spain, the present king of Spain is married to a commoner who's also divorcee. And uh, in the UK, of course, Prince Harry has married a commoner, a divorcee. And, uh, of course, William also married a commoner, not a divorcee, but a commoner. Look at uh, verse 16. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Save me for thy mercy's sake. The Lord desires mercy, not sacrifice. And here he says, make thy face to shine upon thy servant. There's a picture of, uh, picture of sin, there's a picture of shame, going back to not, as, not only Israel as a nation rejecting Jesus, or for the, Old Testament, uh, for the Old Testament rejecting their prophets, but there's a specific sin here. And yet one of the great uh, truths uh, from James chapter 5, in fact keep your hand and go to James chapter 5, is if you find yourself sick, like seriously sick, like at death's door, it could be sin related. And if it's sin related in James chapter 5, Uh, James chapter 5, for example, uh, it says in verse 14, 
is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Any sin that a Christian can commit, go back to Psalm 31, can be forgiven. You're told to confess your sins. And that's a wonderful thing to say this morning because a lot of religions don't have that assurance. If you look at Roman Catholics uh, in Central America, South America, or the Philippines, or Catholic countries in general, every Easter time they whip themselves, they cut themselves, they crucify themselves, they behave like barbarians, like uh, heathen, and their priests say nothing to stop it. Of course, in the West it's more civilised, but it's still the same thing, basically. There's been uh, famous Catholics over the years that would whip themselves, uh, flagellate themselves to become holier, and uh, there's one famous Catholic whose name escapes me. And uh, when he died, they realised he'd been wearing a... Uh, what's it called? A hair shirt. A hair shirt. Yeah. forget the guy's name. Mary DeVal. Mary DeVal, I think some Cardinal other... Cardinal Mary DeVal, yeah. Cardinal Mary DeVal. There's yeah. a couple other people I had in mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he was trying to save himself, really. He was trying to keep his flesh down, which is commendable, of course. But you're told to do everything through Christ. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. It goes back to that, that uh, verse back in... I think it's first samuel it is not god going back to the ark of the covenant it is not god and of course the people were calling for the ark of the covenant to deliver them and three or four times in first samuel i think it's chapter four from memory the text says it is not god in other words the ark of the covenant won't save you or help you per se it is god that will save you or will help you my times are in thy hand deliver me from the hand of mine enemies there's a plurality of enemies hot on the heels of king david and from them that persecute me, also in reference to the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, plotting and planning to overthrow the Lord Jesus Christ. And we discussed that many times over the years. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant, not slave. All your new Bibles change the word from servant to slave. We're not slaves, we are servants. In fact, we're not even servants, we're now brethren, fellow heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. All your new Bibles I think it was from 1881 onwards, use different Greek manuscripts. They go back to Westcott and Hort's abomination of a manuscript, and they use that Greek text to produce the New Testament, of course, their New Testament. It's interesting, if you go back over church history, people like uh, D.R. Moody, who wasn't particularly educated, was criticised for being an ordinary man, uh, would speak very quickly, would make a lot of mistakes as he was speaking. And I've spoken about him many times over the years. People would go up to him after his meetings and make fun of his diction his pronunciations his enunciation and they would say to him a, a dl you've been preaching for 45 minutes uh, and i counted 25 grammatical errors that came out of your mouth and of course he would uh, laugh at those people stick his stick his tongue out and say this tongue is being used for the glory of god what is your tongue being used for but he was a good guy to listen to and he would criticize westcott and holt's uh, abomination of a text because of course dl moody was a king james man Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Don't look away from me, Lord. Look towards me. I know I'm an unclean man, an unworthy man. Going back to what Simon Peter would say to the Lord. And uh, Isaiah would say to the Lord. And all of the greats, when they came into contact with the Lord, even uh, Abraham would speak about dust and ashes, as would Job, of course. Save me for thy mercy's sake, not from hell, but save me from those that are persecuting me. So again, it goes back to the lesser David and the greater David. The lesser David was a mortal, sinful man, but a saved man. Again, it goes back to Daniel and Samson and David. If you profile all three of those gentlemen, someone like uh, Daniel uh, is a remarkable man. Contrast him to someone like Samson, who wasn't a remarkable man. Daniel was inwardly and outwardly righteous, whereas uh, Samson was neither. Daniel is a saved man in heaven today, so is Samson. But your average, uh, your average Jew living back in the Old Testament would look at someone like Daniel and say, there's a real man of God, a wonderful man, a eunuch, lives, holy life, lives a holy life, is very careful what he eats, very careful who he associates with. You can't fault him. You can't uh, critique him. And you look at old Samson hanging around with whores, uh, eating food he shouldn't be eating, dishonoring his parents, the fifth commandment, honor thy father and mother, an appalling son of Israel. And yet the word of God says he's in heaven today. You can't judge people's salvation. I know it's always tempting to say he's not a saved man, she's not a saved woman, she's doing this, he's doing that. We all do it, don't we? But you can't do it. Daniel was saved, David was saved, and so was Samson. 31.17 Let me not be ashamed, O Lord. It goes back to verse 1. In thee, O Lord, I put my trust, let me never be ashamed. 
Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bathe me in the blood of Christ, we would say today. Wash me in the blood of Christ. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon thee. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. In other words, shut your mouth. You've died attacking Jesus. You've died attacking Jehovah. You've written books against Jesus and Jehovah. It could be some of the uh, reprobates that came out of the 1960s. Even people like uh, George Orwell, who wrote uh, that infamous book, or famous book, I should say, infamous depending on which side of the spectrum you're on, but that interesting book, 1984, but even George Orwell was a Freemason, had ties to the Fabian Society, and therefore indirectly would be going against the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon thee. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let the wicked be ashamed, like the lost, never saved to begin with. Let the wicked be ashamed, and let them be silenced in the grave. Of course, when you go to hell, the first death, you are still conscious. You're able to see, you're able to speak, you're able to communicate, you're able to feel. There's a sense of eternal shame and remorse. And all those people we've spoken about over the years, Bertrand Russell, Bernard Shaw, and uh, when Richard Dawkins passes away, and uh, the guy from Cambridge, what's his Hawkins. name? Hawkins, mm-hmm. in the wheelchair, mm-hmm. all these people, and all those filthy comedians, uh, British and American. There's so many people that we could list. We won't, of course. Their names aren't worthy to be repeated. But all those people over the years have made it a career. They've made it a religion, basically. They're very, they're very evangelical when it comes to attacking what we hold to, what we believe in. And yet, why would they bother? Why do they bother? If God isn't real, if Jesus isn't real, why do they care what we think? Why are they always attacking our Saviour? One more time, 3117. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord. He obviously was ashamed. He had uh, guilt over his sin, which of course is a good thing. Paul speaks about godly sorrow leading to repentance in Second Corinthians. And Christians do sin, they shouldn't, but they do. All of your greats in both Testaments would sin, and yet by the grace of God, if you read the New Testament carefully, whenever the New Testament quotes people from the Old Testament, whenever the New Testament speaks about those from the Old Testament, did you notice it puts them in a good light? It doesn't criticize them, ever. You say, why would that be? Because they're saved. They're under grace, of course. Let them be silent in the grave, let them be quiet in the grave. No more cursing, cussing, blaspheming, griping, making uh, blasphemous remarks. In fact, keep your hand there. Go to uh, Revelation, I think it's Revelation uh, 13. I sat down yesterday morning to read Revelation. And I went through Revelation maybe six years ago. And I uh, found some good stuff yesterday. Again, fresh stuff that you do whenever you read the Word of God. Somebody once said this book is alive, and there's a lot of truth in that. And uh, I want a verse in chapter th- uh, chapter 13, which speaks about the uh, beast blaspheming. Uh, here we go. Those in heaven. 13.6, Revelation 13.6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. Go back to Psalm 31. Look at 18 this time. Let the lion lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This goes back to slander and libel. Slander uh, concerns what you say. And of course libel is what you write. Uh, Patrick has written two books. And I've written many articles over the years. And you've got to be careful what you write, obviously. And you've got to be careful what you say. If you can't back up in a court of law... What you say, uh, you're in trouble. Because if you know you're right, stand by your guns, as they say. Don't buckle. There's one thing I really despise. It's when people start to buckle. They get criticised for saying something which is unpopular, not politically correct, but they're still correct in what they say. And they get a lot of heat uh, from the left, uh, from the woke community. Going back to my uh, facetious comments about uh, Daniel, Samson and David being uh, privileged people, white privileged is that what they call it, white privilege? Of course, it's a made-up term, made up by white, middle-class atheists, I might add, but don't get me started on that. And if you do right, or if you speak, or if you are somebody in the public eye, be careful what you say. Uh, if you are an author, you have uh, people who check what you say, not just to proofread what you say, but to check the legal aspect of what you've written. What did I say, Second Timothy? Yeah. Uh, get them in a minute lost my place and uh there have been famous libel cases over the years i think was it this summer early last no this early this year you had johnny depp went to the high court in london to sue his ex-wife 
Amber somebody, a couple of evil rep baits, those two, both Satanists, and I will say that this morning, and you can sue me if you want, I stand by my guns. Uh, two Satanists went to the high courts, and I think Johnny lost his case against Amber. Is it Amber? I forget her surname, doesn't matter anyway. A couple of evil people, I've lost my place, uh, I think it's 2 Timothy 3, and sometimes these people are ruined we spoke about that sodomite doctor a couple of weeks ago who took a woman to court a northern island politician second timothy chapter three please second timothy chapter three and of course he lost and she's wiped the floor with him and i read yesterday or day before yesterday he's now bankrupt he got he's got to try and raise a quarter of a million to pay her legal fees be careful people be careful what you say but of course the context slander goes back to the jews criticizing jesus the jews criticizing their prophets and of course, I gave the scripture from Revelation 17, how the Antichrist uh, slandering those in heaven, of course. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, uh, verse 12, a famous passage, of course. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That goes back to uh, verse 15 again. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Go back to Psalm 31. So if you are living for the Lord, if you're struggling uh, with those all around you, and many times your critics will be Christians, uh, religious people, you're in good company. Uh, Paul's enemies would make fun of his appearance. They would criticize his uh, demeanor, as would D.L. Moody's. And yet it's like this. Who can remember two or three of Moody's enemies? None of you can, of course. Uh, who can remember two or three of Paul's enemies? Well, of course, none of you can, of course. It's like John Wesley. He got saved, started to preach in and around uh, his part of the UK. I think it was from the east of England, from memory. And he preached at, he, he preached at the church, outside of the church that his uh, parents were married in. C of E Church, of course, Anglican Church. Got up on the tombstone of his father, I think, from memory. Started to preach. They didn't like it, the elders, the deacons, the vicars. And they said to John, get down from there. You're making a fool of yourself. He didn't care, of course. And he would preach, what, 50 years? Solid. Day and night, get up at four in the morning, pray for an hour and a half, get on a horse, travel half a, half a day to preach on the streets, to get beaten up, to get uh, stoned, to get spat on, to be dragged around the streets of places like Wigan and Bolton and elsewhere. And uh, people make fun of him, uh, criticise him. And yet, who can remember those enemies of his today? You can't. I can't. Who can remember four or five bishops that went against him? I can't. You can't. But we remember John, don't we? He took a stand... And he went down as one of the greats, of course. Uh, Thirty-one, seventeen again. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon thee, not for salvation, but for deliverance. Let the wicked be ashamed, those that were criticising David based on jealousy, not just King Saul and his men of war, not just Absalom and his men of war, but also going back to Judas Iscariot and the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and let them be silent in the grave. The word of God says how Judas went to his place, Acts chapter 1. Let the lion lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and, contempt, uh, and contemptuously against the righteous. They make fun of Christians. I think it was Mrs. Whitehouse. She was a Methodist, I think, from memory. And she took a stand against television, took a stand against the media, took a stand against smut in general, filth in general, blasphemy, pornography specifically. And the media made fun of her and... She worked very, close, uh, very closely with a Roman Catholic by the name of Lord Longford. Of course, we met Lord Longford many years ago. He had been raised a Protestant, and he had an accident. He had a, he, uh, he had a horse in an accident, fell off his horse, bashed his head, and overnight he became a Roman Catholic. And his daughter is one of Britain's uh, most famous uh, writers. And uh, her name escapes me. It may come to me in a few minutes, but she's written many famous books over the years. And I've got... Four or five of her books. She's written about Mary, Queen of Scots. She's written about uh, King James. She's a Roman Catholic, of course. But uh, Longford and uh, White House work very closely to try and uh, clean up television, which, of course, you can't do. Try to regulate the radio, which, of course, you cannot do. And the media made a lot of fun of her, called her names. They called Longford Lord Porn. Lord Porn, that was it. Again, just making fun of these people, speaking proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. I'm not saying she was saved. She probably wasn't, nor was Longford. They were both ecumenical, which, of course, is unacceptable. He was a Catholic. Like I say, he would convert. She was a Protestant. She was a Methodist. But their hearts were partly in the right place. Uh, 
And again, let the lion lips be put to silence, those dirty lips, lion lips, abominable lips, which speak grievous things proudly. They do it proudly, openly, not secretly, uh, but out in the open, and contemptuously against the righteous. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Also goes back to how fear was on every side, found uh, in verse uh, 13. Also found back in Jeremiah, and the reference will be Jeremiah 6, uh, 25, Jeremiah 20, verse 10, Jeremiah 46, 5, and Jeremiah 49, 29. Which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. This is also partly in reference to the Antichrist, which I'll come to in a moment. But again, verse 19, O oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. If I keep your hand there and go to Second Corinthians, make it First Corinthians 2, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That's of course is a quote from the Old Testament, Isaiah 64, 4. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Go back to Psalm 31, uh, 19 again. Oh, how great is thy goodness. That's positive, of course. Which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, prepared for those that fear him. Going back to John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee. Going back to how the uh, just shall live by faith. Now we're saved by faith, not works, of course. Before the sons of men, your outward appearance. Honours the Lord uh, hugely. Going back to uh, James chapter 2. Look at verse 20. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion. From the strife of tongues. <clears throat> Keep your hand and go to Daniel chapter 11. Thou shalt hide them, thou shalt hide them in the secrets of thy presence from the pride of man. Pride of man, going back to the Antichrist, a very prideful man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion, uh, like a shelter, from the strife of tongues. And this one obscure verse from Daniel 11 is also found in Hosea. Ah, uh, Daniel... 11, Daniel 11, I think it's verse uh, 41. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Go to uh, Hosea, uh, Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2, look at verse 14. Therefore behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfortably unto her. One more, go to Revelation 12. Uh, Revelation chapter 12. People like uh, Mary Whitehouse and uh, Frank Packham, known as Lord Longford, uh, meant well. Did what they could, but of course time was against them. The swing and 60s came along. And uh, once you give people freedom to sin, uh, freedom to do what they want, it's basically impossible to uh, take that from them and stop people from uh, indulging in sin. Ironically, someone like Hugh Hefner, who was uh, the playboy guy, was impotent yeah. for many years. But of course, you weren't to know that. That was released after his death, of course. But the... Appearance that was offered, the uh, uh, the illusion that all was well, was of course fraudulent. It's like these magic shows, or these TV shows. You watch these TV shows, or you watch a movie, or you go to see a show. For example, you see the magician up on the stage, cutting a woman in half, or making the elephant disappear, or doing something which looks really quite clever. And yet, it's very simple how they do it. Yeah. But when you first see it for the first time, you think, that's incredible, how do they do that? It's like that trick that uh, Copperfield did back in the uh, 80s. He made an elephant disappear in Las Vegas. And people thought, how did he do that? 
And for years, it wasn't clear how he did it. And eventually, it was revealed he did it through mirrors. Smoke and mirrors. Just smoke and mirrors. Yeah. It's so simple. Or Houdini. Houdini was very good at uh, escaping uh, out of a jam. He'd lock himself, he'd, he'd padlock himself up, put himself into uh, one of those uh, jackets, straight jackets, which you use on people in asylum centers, uh, the nut house, basically. And uh, people say, how, how's he going to get out of that situation? How's he going to free himself? Uh, from being padlocked, or he jump into the River Thames, uh, padlocked with fifteen different padlocks, wearing all the uh, straight clothing. Of course, he had a key in his mouth. <laughs> as simple as that. But so many people uh, just get completely uh, taken in by these magicians. Uh, Revelation uh, twelve. Revelation twelve. Uh, look at verse six. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had the place prepared of God. A bit like uh, John 14, I prepare a place for you, but not quite. And the woman fled into the wilderness, this of course is Israel in the tribulation, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand, two hundred and three score days. What's that, three and a half years? So you take all these verses together, go back to Psalm 31, and you've got in verse 20, a hidden uh, prophecy buried in the 31st Psalm. It's taken us, what, three weeks uh, to arrive here. But again, one more time, thou shalt hide them in the secrets of thy presence from the pride of man. It's pride that will run the Antichrist. It's pride which uh, ruined the devil, of course. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Going back to slander, be careful what you say, libel, be careful what you write. Blessed be the Lord, for he hath showed me his marvellous kindness in a strong city. Strong in the sense of secure, obviously. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. It's only by the grace of God we're not consumed each and every day. Uh, many of us, if we got what we deserved, would be just wiped out many years ago. It wasn't just uh, Spurgeon, who was a very well-to-do man, who lived a very comfortable life. And he too was slandered, I should also say. A lot of people in London hated him, not just due to jealousy, uh, but he would preach against sin and uh, would take a stand to be fair to him. And yes, I know there are a lot of, there's a lot of stuff about his Masonic connections, quite possibly, uh, like Bernardo. We wrote about Bernardo many years ago, started off as a street preacher, joined the Lodge later in life, which is always somewhat bizarre, why you join the Lodge so late in life. Or someone like uh, Ronald Reagan, beloved in America, and yet he became a Mason, honorary Mason, 1989, quite late in life, after he left office. Booth. Who? Booth. Booth. Yeah, another one. Uh, this is where you'll be very careful uh, who you follow, who you look up to. I know for a lot of American friends, they still think very highly of uh, Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And in the UK, a lot of people still think very highly of Boris uh, Johnson. But you can't follow any of these people. I mean, you can pray for them, of course. Uh, but they're just flesh and blood. And, of course, when they fall... They fall very hard. Blessed be the Lord, for he hath showed me his marvellous kindness in a strong city. I said in my haste, he was too quick to say this, I am cut off from before thine eyes. You can't lose your salvation, incidentally. You can lose your peace, you can lose your joy, you can lose your life. But if you're saved, you're saved. And here David thinks it's all over. He thinks uh, his best days are behind him. And yet that's not true at all. It's interesting when you look at a lot of these famous people over the years, and I have done for a long time, uh, their careers start to nosedive, and they feel they're all washed out, and then bang, back on their feet again. It's unusual. It's also somewhat demonic. I saw a thing last night about the American pop star Katy Perry. She was a country singer, a gospel singer, in fact. Her parents are pastors, quote-unquote, and she came from a very religious family, Katy, and she was going nowhere, apparently. She was trying to break into the music world, and uh, she's got quite a bit of talent, so we'll give her that. She can sing a song. She can also write music. But she wasn't going anywhere, basically. Her career was uh, her career was basically washed up. Parents had been praying for her for a long time. Well, her parents are somewhat odd. They're just such a strange couple. Mother's a so-called pastoress. Father's a pastor. And yet they've got a lot of strange contacts. Very dubious couple. But anyway, Katie was going nowhere, singing uh, all these Christian... Uh, songs, uh, contemporary songs, which I don't particularly care for, nor do I know particularly well. 
And uh, she met some producers in Hollywood and they said to her, ditch all that religious stuff and uh, we will make you famous. Of course, what they meant to say was ditch Christianity and embrace the occult, which of course she did. And she's more religious now than she ever was. Of course, she's preaching Satanism. She's preaching about hell, uh, Egyptian uh, deities, the one-eyed God, all that stuff. And of course, she's completely sold her soul, literally. But David thinks it's all over in verse 22. I said in my haste, I'm cut off. From before thine eyes, Daniel 9 speaks about the Messiah being cut off, but not for himself. You can be cut off in a physical sense, like die prematurely, like Solomon would do. But of course, Messiah was cut off physically for the sins of the world. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications, my prayers and my petitions, when I cried unto thee, as would Samson. You think about Samson, hanging around with Delilah, and his people got fed up with him. They handed him over to the uh, Philistines evil bunch of idolaters and of course idolatry is the worst sin in scripture if you are saved and of course if you're not saved the worst sin is unbelief and old Samson was handed over to the Philistines and they worked him over took his eyes out shaved all his hair off they said uh, make sport for us and old old uh, Samson who governed Israel for what 20 years he starts praying back in I think it's Judges and uh, he says to the Lord basically uh, if you will avenge me for my eyes I will uh, bring all this to an end basically and the Lord allowed his hair to grow back the Lord heard uh, Samson's prayer and he collapsed the house and all those pagans were destroyed so this is David's prayer his prayers are being answered and yet David's got sin in his life we're not sure what it is and as he prays and uh, turns back to the Lord the Lord hears his prayers and answers his prayers O love the Lord all ye his saints for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer I don't think David was always faithful. I know that uh, Samson wasn't. So I know that I'm not. And I'm sure you're not. Plentifully, but more than enough, rewardeth the proud doer, those that go against God. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Of course, the blessed hope for us is, of course, uh, the rapture. And the woman's name I was thinking of was Antonia Fraser. Of course, Antonia Fraser. Pacman's was also a historian. Excuse me, she was his daughter. <laughs> Longford's wife, Elizabeth, was also a writer. Antonia Fraser is, of course, their daughter. She's a famous British Catholic writer. And I'll say one other thing very quickly. I've got four or five of her books. Doesn't mention the devil. Doesn't mention hell. Occasionally mentions God in her books. And just before the service began, I was discussing with Patrick how suspicious I am of famous authors who write books about famous people, anyone, and uh, never tell you that a lot of these people are into the occult into Freemasonry, into witchcraft, into Satanism. And I think one of the reasons why they don't tell you that is because they are also into such activity. Be of good courage, positive, and he shall strengthen your heart. This is David's problem. His heart is worn out, basically. Or ye that hope in the Lord, going back to the blessed hope, being the rapture, of course. So once again, 24 verses, looking at King David, the lesser, and also in type, uh, the greater David. And how these two uh, would fight. Christ would fight on our behalf. And uh, David would also fight on behalf of his people. And as I thought, Saul, yes, was a Benjamite. 1 Samuel 9, 1. And of course, David uh, from the tribe of Judah as well. So it's always interesting when you check people's lineage. Of course, you to be careful of that. Uh, because that can turn into an idol. And Paul speaks against uh, foolish uh, genealogies see like the church of rome they've turned their church into an idol they've turned their eucharist into an idol and of course uh, a lot of christians have turned israel into an idol as well got to be careful about that so i think we'll close it there and next week we'll come back and look at psalm uh, 32